You might know my first guest this week from seeing his name on the front of the Atlantic magazine, but he's also been on this program twice before. James Fallows has been with the Atlantic for over 30 years and as national correspondent has been working on his latest cover story, How America is Putting Itself Back Together. Jim, along with his wife, Deborah, who you'll meet in just a few minutes, recently hosted a conference at the University of Redlands with mayors from around the country. It was called American Futures, the People, Organizations, and Ideas Reshaping the Country, and it was the first of what they expect to be many hosted at the university. So welcome back to Inside the Studio, Jim. Um, Evan, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here again on your show. I have to compliment you on the wonderful conference that you put on on January 30th. It was a day filled with panels and Q&A sessions. Attendance included University of Redland students, professors, and administration, but also other city mayors. And so how do you think it went? Uh, I think it went very well. And part of what Deb and I wanted to convey through this conference was the both the stimulation and the basically positive feeling we'd gotten in the past two years of traveling around the country, including last year when we were based at the University of Redlands, looking at cities and their leaders and their organizations who are finding some way to cope with the economic and political and environmental and other challenges they had. And we had five very interesting mayors who traveled from around the country to be here, plus some local supporting cast, including Redlands' own and the U of R's own Pete Aguilar, former mayor of Redlands, now congress congressman from here. So I thought that they conveyed in their answers to the questions and their discussions with each other some of the sense of just promise mm -hmm. that we had seen in lots of different parts of the country. I thought one of the most intriguing points that was made during that conference was when one of the mayors um, of Fresno said that she takes the mentality of giving credit where credit is due. And so what impressed you about most about the in innovation of that city? So, so here's the context, partly about Fresno itself and partly about this mayor, Ashley Swearingen, who some of your listeners may have heard of. She's uh, been – she's nearing the end of her second term. She's unfortunately term limited as a liberal Republican female mayor of a central uh, valley California city. The panel of mayors we had, a couple of them were Republicans, Ashley Swearingen and Knox White from Greenville, South Carolina. A couple were Democrats. We had uh, Don Ness of Duluth, uh, Minnesota, and Nan Whaley of Dayton, Ohio. And one is officially nonpartisan, Rusty, Rusty Bailey from here in Riverside. And the fascinating thing to us is that they had they ran their cities essentially beyond partisan divides. All the things that we have become so accustomed to in the paralysis and the blame apportioning and just the general uh, malaise of national politics just didn't enter the way that they did their business. So a reason we had gathered them was to say, if we accept the premise that mayors of different parties and different generations and a variety of races and both genders and all kinds of, of backgrounds were being effective in bringing people together at their local level, what would it take to convert that success, that mentality, that ability to uh, to surmount difficulties to the national level where it seemed to be so lacking now? So I was asking each of, I was pressing each of them on that point. And the point that, that <clears throat> excuse me, Mayor Swearingen made was was this business of giving credit where credit is due. And I think what she was saying both implicitly and a couple of times uh, ex explicitly is that the structure of national politics in for the last decade or two has been you first decide who has come up with an idea. And based on whether they are friend or foe, you think it's a good or bad idea, essentially tribal politics as opposed to substantive politics. And she was saying, as did the other Republican in the panel, Knox White of uh, Greenville, South Carolina, that there were some things that the Obama administration, the hated by national Republicans Obama administration had done that made their life better in having transport plans or coordinating the effort of getting federal grants or whatever. So she that was something that I, I thought for her distillation of what she learned in Fresno and included that. Now, Fresno itself uh, some of I imagine some of your listeners have been there. It's one of these cities in California that historically has not been a center of glamour. If you have Malibu or La Jolla or Carmel or San Francisco on one side of the glamour scale, Fresno would be on the other, and they are hyper aware of that themselves. So finding some way to turn around their sense of, even Mayor Swearingen said, self-hatred 
in Fresno, feeling as if they were losers, as if it was a city that people left to go either north to San Francisco or south to, to uh, Los Angeles or San Diego or the Inland Empire. That, so that, that was part of how they've engineered a tech turnaround, a downtown reconstruction. They're going to be the center of the high-speed rail. So she has a local success story to tell, and she was trying to say what that would mean if we applied that approach to national politics. Talk about art, though, in Fresno, because that was very interesting <laughs> and unexpected. Uh, yes. Yeah, so w- when Deb and I first got to Fresno, we were uh, – after we got over the sh- – the, um, our initial shock at the, how the downtown is really just war-torn, sort of a war zone. They're, they're trying now to make it the focus of a renovation – was finding what an active arts community there is uh, there. There's something, an annual festival called The Rogue, which has hundreds of acts from all over the country. It goes on for about two weeks. They have public art all over the place. And one of the people who's a producer of The Rogue Festival said, from their point of view, it's not simply that Fresno will be the Bohemia of California. She said, we are the Bohemia of California. And what she meant was, if you're trying to be an artist, either a performing artist or a, a, a visual artist of some sort or even a writer, in San Francisco or, uh, or Los Angeles, the, the oppression of rent, of real estate cost, just destroys everything about your life. And historically, bohemias and arts districts have been in places that are these marginal neighborhoods where life is cheap. And so they say Fresno is an entire city where life is cheap. And so that they've tried to make themselves a an edgy arts community and do the the sort of contrarian thing of changing the narrative of saying, oh, we're a place where real estate is so cheap because nobody wants to be here, into saying real estate is so cheap so you artists can come here and this can be this can be a happening place. And I think it's becoming that. What was the most refreshing thing that you heard at the conference overall? Maybe something you weren't expecting. I think it was uh, the most reassuring thing t- to me was that mayors we'd seen in different parts of the country sort of performed. <laughs> it wasn't just that we were – had been sort of gulled by them. We were traveling around. We were so interested by, by Greenville that we, we had sort of come under the false spell of, of, uh, of Mayor White or Duluth or whatever else. I think it was the fact that a number of these mayors had thought very creatively – about what it took to lead a community. And maybe the one who I thought was, was most surprising in a good way to me was Don Ness of, of, uh, of Duluth, Minnesota. Duluth is a place many of your listeners might not have been to. It's right on the tip of Lake Superior. It's way up in the North Woods. Bob Dylan was, was born there. When we went there just after Memorial Day a year plus ago, the ice flows were literally just coming off Lake Superior in May, at the end of May, so it's a really distant place. But he was saying how in this Fargo-like remote environment where population had gone down over the last century from its days as a big mining center and a, and a grain center, they were changing the narrative to think – just finding ways to, to have a contrarian sense of – the way we think about ourselves, we need to sort of put in a different direction. And the point I'm getting to here, I, I've just been thinking about this ever since then, is he was saying that, that that to be authentic with a narrative of a leader and a community and a, and, a, and a city, there has to be – authenticity includes a note of vulnerability, of recognizing we're taking risks and saying we're going to aim for this or that. We recognize where we failed. We recognize the things where we might be making mistakes – but nonetheless being willing to, to take that effort. I, I thought that was a – it was the last thing that was uh, – last note in the conference from, from Don Ness as we had a panel of, of mayors. And that was the one that, that maybe maybe because it was last but maybe because it, it was so interesting to me that, that it stuck with me of finding ways to strike that authentic note for communities of both aspiration and vulnerability and honesty and heart and mind together. And if there is some way – to elevate that from the Duluth and Fresno and Redlands and Greenville and Dayton level to the national level, that would be a real achievement. After the Esri presentation that talked about the true value of geographic information systems, also known as GIS, I realized that pretty much all the data is required um, to be given by participation of the citizens. So their participation is required. What are your thoughts 
on the seemingly obvious need for that civic enga- engagement. I, I think that that's something that mayors in a lot of these cities have worked as it happens with Esri here in Redlands over the last decade or two. And I think they're finding ways that there are, as you say, citizens have to participate, but there are ways in which that becomes natural. If you can use the the analogy of the ways traffic system where people, uh, they, they want to... Uh, some of the information submitted there is automatic, you know, the speed of your car. But if you see a traffic camera, a policeman, a pothole, whatever, you can report that. It becomes part of a public big data uh, set. So, too, in your city, if you get in the habit of saying, well, here's a uh, mailbox that's knocked over, and you take a picture of it, a geotagged picture, and you send it in, that be- or you say, here's a pothole, or here's something that's not working right, there's a way in which if that becomes effortless and seamless, then then every part of the community becomes sort of a sensing system. And you have a whole thinking community of things people want to report uh, that just becomes part of the nervous system of the city. Now let's talk about your article in The Atlantic, the cover story, How America is Putting Itself Back Together. Essentially, you look at what city governments are doing successfully while the national government is seemingly failing to be effective. What was your inspiration for taking on such a project? The inspiration was the travels that Deb and I have done for the last two and a half years and our little airplane, which I've talked with you about on your show, and essentially saying, is the theme that we hear in national politics and most of the national news media essentially that of clash, polarization, inability to agree, and decline? Does that bear up when you go city by city and state by state? And what we found is that that if you looked at the fabric of American society at this more granular level, level, you saw people still trying to do the things that we think of Americans as wanting to do, of finding gr- agreements within their community, of taking responsibility for the entire community, of being pra- finding practical solutions to problems. And f- reporting on these things does not eliminate any of the well-known national problems that, of course, we have, but it, it enriches the picture. It's not simply this black and white um, collision that we see at the national level, but we also see people who are trying to respond to these pressures, find solutions, and we hope add to a different and more constructive narrative of what's ha- happening in the United States now. Did you seem to feel that you achieved what you were going out for when you started that project? The reason I love journalism is there's so much that you never know until you just show up and and and, and look. So I was I was interested in this conference with each of the cities. We're talking about Fresno or Duluth or Dayton. I asked people there, "Have you ever been there?" And most of the mayors had not been to each other's cities. Most of the of the people attending had never been to most of these places. And we got to go to all these places and dozens more. So in terms of having a different sense of what holds the country together, I feel as if we know a lot more than we used to. We're going to keep doing doing this for for another while. And so trying to just not have the conclusive story of America, but more of the story and also more that that people don't know enough about. So your project's been going from city to city. Do you have a favorite city? Well, of course, Redlands. (laughs) (laughs) I was setting that up for you. Yes, yes. Redlands is the place where we feel most like home. But there are half a dozen cities, including those represented here, Duluth, Fresno, Greenville, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Columbus, Mississippi, Eastport, Maine, all of which I thought, I'd never heard of these places before. I'd heard of them, but I'd never even considered them as real places to live. And Deb and I keep saying, you know, we could actually live here. We could actually live in Sioux Falls. We could actually live in Greenville. But of course, we would most love to live in Redlands itself. Well, it's great to have you back home and great to have you back in the studio jim fallows national correspondent for the atlantic magazine thank you so much my pleasure thank you evan 